the organizers for giving this opportunity to speak here. So uh, I think I can uh, uh, connect to the presentations done uh, till now. Uh, uh, the former speaker uh, talked about uh, uh, you know, from uh, rocket to uh, common man. I think uh, that's what I'm trying to speak out here. That's what we are trying to do. And uh, also, I, I must thank uh, Dr. Ramadasi for giving a very good overview uh, right from the materials to the electric vehicle, fuel cell vehicle. So my effort here will be to uh, concentrate on one element in that. That will be a fuel cell stack and specifically PEM fuel cell stack. And, and that's what my expertise is. And in fact, we are working on PM fuel cell stack uh, system uh, as well as uh, uh, PM electrolysis. So uh, I, I, I am uh, trying to speak to the uh, speak about the uh, some of our modest achievements uh, what we have uh, had in this, and uh, of course uh, that experience uh, the has given us some insights into the. Uh, possible challenges as we go uh, further and uh, probably what, uh, uh, I mean, what are the solutions for that and what, what our perspective on how it should be. So uh, basically all the conventional missions in space, uh, so as we know today's rockets and satellites, they generally work on batteries. So. Uh, the present day lithium ion and they were increasing energy density of lithium ion is probably satisfying that. So, but as we move ahead, because these missions involve minutes of powering, uh, from seconds to few minutes or maybe even 15 to 20 minutes. So batteries are good enough for that. But as we move towards future missions, uh, when it comes to uh, Indian space program, and of course, you can always uh, recollect some of the path-breaking missions of the past uh, elsewhere uh, from NASA. Uh, missions like uh, exploratory missions, uh, human in space missions, uh, reusable uh, vehicles, um, lunar mass outposts that uh, we are talking about today. These would require uh, uh, fuel cells. And uh, they involve very huge uh, energy on board, standby energy on board. And that's where fuel cell is coming in. And they are all uh, futuristic uh, missions. So these are some of the, our early achievements, uh, starting from some of the very small cells. Uh, and then uh, coming to stacks, uh, some of the pictures uh, you have seen from the earlier presentations. So these are the stacks uh, that uh, we had come up with in the past, uh, years back. Uh, about one to three kilowatt power uh, we were generating. And uh, we could also you know, add a flare of uh, the overall system. Uh, the stack alone does not give you the power and you need to uh, make a total system out of it with all the balance of land, and this also we could successfully do. But these are all of uh, small power. And we were graduating to higher power levels as well as some more maturity in the technology, but in the course of that uh, program, you can also see that uh, our uh, work is basically you know, focused on hydrogen oxygen systems. Uh, you can contrast it with the system that you require for uh, vehicles, which is hydrogen air, there are certain uh, fundamental difference uh, in a certain materials and also uh, the design strategies what we adopt. Uh, so uh, we also got a kind of uh, an experience on hydrogen air system, rather uh, small power, uh, but uh, it was interesting uh, from uh, very fundamentals to the application uh, there was an idea of putting uh, fuel cells for automatic weather stations. In fact, that was a time when fuel cells was getting into uh, applications or small power applications like surveillance and uh, so on. So we also got into this uh, automatic weather stations. Uh, these stations, I think uh, maybe you are familiar or uh, annoyingly we are all using this uh, weather station spread across uh, the, all over the country, thousands of them. They are gathering real-time weather data and are uh, probably, we are all getting the weather data in our mobile phones uh, through 
from these weather stations through the satellites. So our idea was to uh, replace the existing battery solar panel combination uh, with the fuel cell so that you can ensure uh, guaranteed operation even under adverse weather conditions. And wherein the weather stations are very crucial. Uh, we try to use it in uh, some uh, places, you know, like uh, Shillong, where uh, Mekhalia, where we have the uh, heaviest rain. So you have longest monsoon and batteries get drained out and weather data gets blacked out. So uh, we also tried in uh, the Raudun in our own uh, campus. So we could operate it for years. Uh, extremely good experience in uh, uh, having the cylinder. And uh, these are all done, uh, you know, uh, I think about five years back or six years back or so. And then 100 watt power level. And then uh, we also had a nice experience of having a portable fuel cell, taking it up to Gangotri Glacier for a land survey over there. Uh, it was a very low temperature scenario. Of course, it was not freezing. Of course, for uh, we were lucky not to have a freezing condition. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we used it for effectively prolonging the uh, scientific survey uh, from uh, uh, several days or weeks long to we could bring it down to a few days. So that so it, it, this was because each day we could operate for more time, uh, which was not possible otherwise. So uh, with this experience, now uh, we went ahead with uh, in uh, full stream uh, with uh, higher power. For, for that, we have established a, a dedicated laboratory which can uh, which can, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which can, uh, um, uh, with which we can do material development, electrode processing, assembly, uh, uh, as testing. I, in fact, it is almost ready up to about 20 kilowatt, and uh, we are also looking forward to even higher. So uh, the total end to end uh, uh, dedicated facility we are having. We are also uh, looking at next generation. Uh, when we say next generation high power density stack, that's the uh, uh, that is the you know uh, 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 theme of uh, today. So these stacks uh, at various levels uh, we are graduating now to the uh, 20 kilowatt and higher. So some of the photographs are here and. Uh, Parallelly, we are also trying to put one of the snacks in, uh, one of the system in, uh, converting it into a system as uh, shown here in bottom, and with all uh, cylinder and pump, everything together, and then uh, putting it in space and uh, trying to have some experience out of that as well. So some of these works are going on. Now, uh, when, we, when, I, when I try to look at uh, taking this technology for uh, further, especially towards common man, uh, we know that this is the you know, widely known, uh, uh, when you look at the technical targets or even the targets for fuel cell stack, uh, these are, uh, it is, uh, in, a, in a simplistic manner, it is put to about six uh, uh, aspects, uh, figure of merit. And then uh, uh, it is said that uh, some of the, almost three or four of them, uh, they have already been achieved, uh, other targets have been achieved namely power density and specific power efficiency and low temperature startup requirements. Uh, however, durability and cost, probably the two aspects which uh, a, a user would really look for. I mean, these are the two things that uh, uh, probably yet to be uh, achieved. So this is where uh, the story uh, starts now. And uh, so, uh, uh, so th this, this probably requires attention worldwide. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, but we know that this is uh, this uh, achievement is uh, limited to a very few agencies in the world. Technology of this level is uh, uh, available only with a few agencies. Not everyone working in this uh, working in this country or around the world on fuel cell stack, uh, they are not having all these attributes achieved. So. Uh, yeah, so if you, if you see the cost targets, if you look at, uh, this is, if you, if you look at this uh, target, uh, it's very rosy picture, the cost is uh, continuously coming on. This is basically showing the targets. Uh, so, uh, and targets uh, estimated for a production level of one lakh uh, units manufactured per year of system. 
And you can see the, in the end, uh, it is projected that that PP and fuel cell system of EV class will come out at about $30 per kilowatt, an extremely ambitious figure. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, if their 2020 figure is about 80, $80, I probably we will be around two to 2.5 times above that if you estimate it uh, based on the current uh, costing against this target. Uh, and what is available will be even another uh, two times more. Uh, so that is the scenario uh, what is there today. And if you try to get into final details of that, a system uh, has so many elements. And in that, the biggest one is, of course, the PM fuel cell stack, as it was mentioned by chairman and others. So uh, as you can see in the red, uh, it, it covers more than 50% of the course. It continues to be so even when the numbers are increasing. If you look at the stack cost in further details, from say 10,000 per year to see uh, 5 lakh uh, uh, of a million uh, per year, uh, the uh, cost of a stack, uh, almost 60% uh, of it is due to the electrodes. Uh, we call it as membrane electrode assemblies. Uh, I'm not very sure uh, how many are really you know, uh, involved in fuel cell development out here and probably are really the developers. Uh, I'm not very sure, but I hope uh, it is uh, uh, conveying. So uh, one particular element or a particular sub-assembly is uh, resulting in this much of uh, costing. So, uh, so that makes me to bring out a little more detail. I, on, on the stage, probably I was bringing up this slide. Uh, we have... Uh, and a marker, marker is not visible here. So you have, uh, as uh, Dr. Ramadasi was mentioning, there is a membrane, proton exchange membrane, there are catalyst layers, and there are certain porous uh, materials. And uh, on either side, you have certain flow field plates. So these constitute one single cell. And then uh, you, you, there are some numbers also written here of what are the thicknesses they are all. They are all very extremely thin layers. These are the typical numbers that generally everybody is working on. Now, uh, uh, and this is how a stack looks like, multiple cells put together, uh, making into a stack of the required power. A single cell will give you about, say, on operating condition, about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volt uh, of whatever current you can design it for. And uh, you need to have hundreds of cells together to make it an EV class stack. For example, 300, 400 cells uh, put together. It's like a filter press assembly to uh, make it more you know, uh, conveying. It involves about kilometers long of ceiling, uh, so making it, you know, achieving the durability uh, quite uh, challenging, in fact. Uh, and, uh, and we are talking about hydrogen, uh, arresting the leak of hydrogen. So it, it really, you know, technological challenge. So that takes us to, let me just uh, summarize it into the whole thing. So now, if you really seriously look at the cost reduction, the first and foremost, it is indeed the reduction of the size of the stack. The specific power needs to be higher. So that automatically brings down the, uh, reduces the quantum of material used in this. All, almost all of them are really new materials uh, with a difficult supply chain and even production itself, the technologies are new. So it makes sense to bring down the consumption of material per kilowatt. So, uh, higher and higher power density certainly makes sense. And this is indeed the first point need to be achieved. So, but that doesn't come automatically. There are multiple elements uh, involved in it. Uh, you need to have ultra high power density. Those who are working in this area may know uh, what it really means to have, uh, to generate one watt per square centimeter. So uh, uh, even our present day lithium ion batteries are far less uh, uh, compared to this. It is only in the case of uh, uh, fuel cells you can really think of such high power, but one watt, is, uh, one watt and higher is what you really need in the under operating conditions. So this is something, uh, an incredible value, and there are some, uh, some of the uh, uh, technology developers have indeed achieved it, claim to have achieved it. And there is another factor called there are certain flow field plates you're using, the fraction of weight due to that needs to be below a number uh, for you to achieve this. Uh, so that uh, takes you to certain special designs of the plate, certain designs of flow channels. 
you need to move away from the conventional scheme. I cannot get into the details in this forum, so I, let me just stop with that. And of course, there are certain cost-effective coating, and all these, when you, you need to have a processes which are manufacturing friendly, which are smart enough uh, to give you the real benefit of the design, and also it is manufacturing friendly. Some of them are really uh, a very totally new type of processes. However, it needs to be you know, taken into a manufacturing friendly. And uh, sealing materials, as I said, uh, of that order, of uh, several hundreds, several kilometers long ceiling needs to be put in a single stack, and the process needs to be in accordance with that. Uh, so uh, the uh, volume-friendly manufacturing process I already mentioned, and there are certain uh, very special machineries required for it. So this is another challenge. Uh, these are all the challenges that a developer uh, for uh, encounters as he moves over from a demonstration of the technology towards uh, putting it in an application and making it acceptable. So uh, out of these two are having very high design uh, uh, challenges and also process development uh, uh, challenges. Uh, some of the numbers that are available in standards, DOE targets are really uh, revealing. So uh, this is something one has to achieve to really make it uh, uh, useful for an application to, 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 so that it is, uh, it, it, it can be considered for an application. And it brings out several other sub uh, challenges like uh, the electrode power density, the catalyst mass activity, material related uh, 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 technologies, uh, process related technology, flow field plate. It, it takes us to uh, certain special processes for uh, uh, making the flow field plate, such as hydroforming and thin metal. Uh, with uh, advanced coating, which is again should be cost effective and, and so on, uh, with extremely corrosion rate. You, you, we, we, are, we are in a position where we ha you have to meet extremely high electrical and thermal conductivity, but at the same time, the we know that met uh, metals are such uh, uh, capabilities, but metals are prone for corrosion, and we need to have one of the extremely lowest corrosion. So it is a kind of uh, uh, paradoxical situation we are in. So, uh, so we need to set these specific targets and uh, achieve it consistently. These are all for uh, the developers, those who are working in this field. So uh, let me just try to summarize for, uh, it can be uh, seen as de developer's dilemma or uh, the challenges or whichever way we can call it. Uh, we need to have access to high performing materials. Even the materials, what I tried to show in one of the previous slides of certain thicknesses, et cetera, we need to go further uh, lower thickness materials, further higher conducting materials. Uh, these are not often readily available. These are all uh, available for very specific uh, 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 agencies or industry or uh, makers. So uh, one, two uh, around the world. So getting it available uh, in large numbers, because if you want to reduce the cost of it, one is designed, other one is scaling it in numbers, and technology has to reach uh, different geographies. If manufacturing has to start in different geographies. For that, these materials need to be available aplenty. So uh, this is one big challenge that we, are, we have to have uh, in front of us. And another one would be the design for target performance and manufacturing. Most often developers, especially in our country, are uh, they make uh, and demonstrate, but that doesn't take uh, beyond a level. Uh, in order to climb the technology readiness level, one has to have this in mind. Uh, and the processes what we develop must be uh, manufacturing oriented. This needs to start from the very basics. Uh, without which, you know, uh, a process that you have made a device and it cannot be really manufactured. So this is something we have to keep in mind. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we need to have very special uh, some of the missionaries and equipments. So uh, with this, I try to uh, summarize and uh, conclude my presentation. And I, uh, uh, I acknowledge uh, the support and guidance from my uh, director VSC and uh, VSC management. Of course, uh, my thanks and gratitude and uh, go, uh, goes to um, uh, my team members at uh, VSC. And thank you all for uh, listening to this presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>